Hello, hello. Now we are reading chapter 29 of Mr. Tweety. Remember, there's only two chapters left, this chapter and the next chapter tomorrow. Chapter 29. The following day, on the last lap before we would put our sights towards home to recross our glorious huge, huge country, I had two unbelievably silly children on my hands, and Mr. Tweety didn't help a bit. In fact, if anything, he acted even more ludicrous than my offspring. Being short on funds until I reached my uncle's home, where I received another check from Manchester, when my children asked me for money to buy some insects at a bait shop for Mr. Toad, I told them, nothing doing. As these toads survived chiefly, chiefly on ants, they could very well look for the crawly things whenever we stopped. This they did, but at every service station they began singing a ridiculous ditty. Give, give, give to the toady fund, give, give, give to the toady fund, give, give, give to the toady fund, just one penny will do, thank you. I have no idea if that's how the song actually goes, but that's what I'm going to sing. This is a little picture of Mr. Tweety and Mr. Toady. Of course, with the robin acting like an idiot cocking his head to look at the funny creature in the shoebox, then my children singing by the window of our old jalopy, all in all, I would have been mortified at such begging tactics had we been at home. However, we were far from anyone who might recognize me. Thus, in the security of animosity, I let the children have their fun. Totaled, they didn't collect more than 11 pennies from two gas, state, two gas attendants, but this spurred them on. For the remainder of the trip, every now and again, they would start their ditty, with or without appreciative audience, and Mother would come across with another penny. That day on the road, once again, I was faced with an impossible, at least seemingly impossible, driving feat. Our route led us over pa Pacheco Pass, a 1,386-foot altitude to be achieved from what seemed like sea level. How the old Chevy ever pulled our load to the top seem, still seems like a miracle to me. After all the other events of this trip, it was almost like asking too much when the car was down to a five-mile-an-hour crawl to expect the good Lord to stretch out his hand and pull us over the top. Even so, I did ask, and I did receive. Despite be a boiling engine, we reached the top safe and sound. Thereafter, the going was a breeze, and we pulled into Redwood City in no time flat. To say that our visit with my uncle was wonderful couldn't begin to describe how I felt. Eric looked like Dad, talked like Dad, and having been Dad's little girl all my life, the experience was one not to be forgotten. It was almost as if my beloved father were with me again. Everything reminded me of him, and with only happy memories of my father, this visit accomplished more in the way of giving me courage for the return trip than anything that I could have asked for before. During our short but lovely stay, in addition to two enjoyable trips, one into Redwood Territory, the other to visit Aunt Mitzi's wonderful relatives in San Francisco, that Robin gave us an unforgettable memory. During the hours that it had taken to go up to San Francisco, Mr. Tweedy had been left in our basement bedroom, free to fly around and amuse himself any way he chose. The moment we returned, the children went out to let him out, anticipating that they would all play together outdoors. Thus, it was more than a little shock to them when, instead of behaving as usual, he flew up to the roof. Hey, Mr. Tweety, don't go up there, Dave called to his bird. Get down here! But Mr. Tweety had other plans. Instead of coming down, he flew even higher to the very peak of the apartment house. Whether or not he was trying to even the score because we had driven off without him in the morning, I don't know. However, he certainly did a thorough job of it. As he flew from one rooftop to the next, the children and I followed him along the street, intermittently calling to the rascal who seemed to be paying no attention to us. Finally, when we reached the end of the block and Mr. Tweedy flew across to another long row of houses, I was convinced that we had reached the parting of our ways. It's no use, Dave, I told my heartbroken little son. We knew this would happen sometime, and he couldn't have picked a better spot. He'll have lots of robins for company. But Dave wasn't listening. At the top of his lungs, he was calling, begging his robin to return to him. 
Hearing the heartbreak and the tone of my little boy's voice, suddenly I became angry with Mr. Tweedy. But not because he was leaving us. It was his method I disapproved of. If he intended to take his freedom, the least he could do was disappear quickly instead of agonizing the children by dragging out his departure. That's enough, Dave, I said almost sharply. Let him go. And now let's get home for supper. So spoken, I took each of my children by the hand, turned them around, and started walking. When Dave momentarily held back, I tugged at his arm. It's over, Dave. Forget it, I told him, now barely able to keep my own feelings out of my voice. And stop looking back. It won't do any good. With this, my son finally obeyed, and our little trio began walking again. No more than ten, ten steps later, I nearly jumped out of my skin. Mr. Tweedy had landed upon my shoulder. That ends the reading for chapter 29. Tune in tomorrow for the last and final chapter, chapter 30. Mr. Tweedy has been a pretty cool book to learn from. Interactions of a robin and a family. But now let's end with a bedtime prayer. Holy God, thank you for this day. Thank you for um, giving us all that we need and comforting us when we need it the most. Lord, be with us as we fall into our sleep. Give us a good night's rest and comforting and um, blissful dreams. And may we wake up in the morning feeling refreshed, revived, and ready to take on the day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good night. Tune in tomorrow for the last and final chapter of Mr. Tweedy.